Thanks for listening to our online messages from Calvary Chapel North Shore on the island of Kauai. Stay up to date on content and our events on our website, calvarychapelnorthshore.com and on Instagram at CCNS Kauai. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, you can do so on our website. Now let's dive into the word. I've entitled this message, Complete in Him. Did you know you're complete in Jesus Christ? Did you know that you don't need anything else? Did you know even if they take away your church and take away your Bible and put you in prison, they can't take away your faith and relationship with Jesus Christ? And that is so true for so many people around the world who are being persecuted for preaching the gospel, being in prison, being tortured, being beaten, and even being killed for Christ's namesake. I think we got it pretty easy here. Somebody might get upset with us, call us names, but we don't suffer the persecution that around the world that believers suffer and are up against. And so uh, I feel like we're very grateful, but sometimes we forget because of our blessings to serve the King of Kings and to give him our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to devote our lives to him to get the gospel out and and not just to get the gospel to somebody they don't receive it but to keep coming back and trying to reach them not to give up on them and to share the love of God because Jesus is the only way he's the only way and we should never be satisfied just having our salvation and think well I got mine good luck to you that's not the heart of God We have to have a heart for the lost. Those people that drive you crazy, you got to have a heart for them. You have family that drives you crazy, you got to have a heart for them. And you got to let them know that they don't need the things of the world. And as we look at what Paul's going to warn the Colossians church against today is, is to stay away from philosophy. It's empty to see. To stay away from the traditions of men. And the worldly principles, the principles of the world are destructive. They don't think like we do. And there's a lot of folks out there that seem like they're very smart and intelligent, but but apart from Jesus Christ, eventually they're going to steer you down the wrong road. But Jesus will never do that. And so as we look at this portion of Scripture entitled Complete in Him, I want you to understand the deep love that Jesus has for you, the deep love that Paul had for the church at large, and how his heart could be broken seeing the church taken advantage of. His heart could be broken by seeing a brother or a sister fall. Paul really had the heart of Christ. He had such a prayer life. He was praying for everybody. I could only dream to have the same prayer life that he has. He spent so much time in prayer. Every epistle that we look at, it's Paul, I've been praying for you without ceasing. I pray for you always. What a prayer list he had. Because what Paul understood that many of us haven't grabbed onto yet is the power of prayer. The one thing that we're supposed to do the most is the thing that we do the least. And I'm just as bad as you. And the enemy will keep you from prayer because he knows prayer is powerful. Prayer brings forth answers. Prayer gets things moving. The power of prayer. And so in chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 today. Paul says, For I want you to know What great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that your hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." Now this I say, lest any, anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. 
As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head over all principality and power. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Powerful scripture, Lord. Let us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, grab hold of it today and really take it into our hearts and live it out through our lives. Lord, we thank you for the word of God, which you put above your name. And so we know that it's precious. It's precious to us. It's precious to you. And it's the way that we grow in the grace and knowledge of you. So bless this time and give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. So strong warnings. It's so easy to get caught up in the things of the world, isn't it? The philosophies, the traditions of men, empty deceit, the principles of this world that aren't God's principles, the traditions of men that is not of God. It's easy to get caught up in it. And you need to understand outside of Christianity, every religion out there, is based upon philosophy and the traditions of men. Everyone. Well, why are you doing that? Well, because our fathers did that. And why do they do it? Because their fathers did that. It's not scriptural. It's not biblical. It's not of God. God died for the whole world because he loved the whole world. His love for the lost. And for you to respond to that love is what is crucial for eternal life. But the enemy is sly, he's deceiving, he's cunning, and he brings out all these false religions to encourage people, you can do this on your own. You don't need Jesus. You, you are a good person. And the philosophies of the world and the principles of the world and the traditions of men lead people astray and lead them right to hell. People don't like to talk about hell. But it's real. i got to talk about it. Because you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's no in-between. There's no purgatory. There's no praying for the dead. It doesn't work. As a believer, I have Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, dwelling in me. I have the creator of the universe dwelling in me. I have the author and the finisher of my faith dwelling in me. And because he is God, he can guide me through all things. I don't need the philosophy of the world. I don't need the principles of the world. I don't need traditions of men. All I need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. And this lost world that's out there, they need Jesus. So who's going to bring them the message? Well, well, God not only saved you, but gave you an opportunity to be used by him. I bet you the angels are up there chomping at the bit thinking, Lord, why are you trusting these guys to get the gospel out? We could do a much better job. But to understand the true love of a father, he lets his children help, not because they do a better job, because it blesses them. And God wants to bless you. So Paul tells us in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, for I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, which was a suburb of Colossae. Now, Colossae and Laodicea were founded by Epaphras. These were churches that never met Paul. Paul had never been there, but their pastor had spent two years with Paul in Ephesus when he was teaching at Tyrannus. And so he had come to Rome where Paul was in prison to tell him, a report of what's going on in these areas and telling them about some of the things that they're up against. And Paul says that I have great conflict. I'm in agony for your church, for the church of Christ because of the false doctrine and the wolves that are trying to creep in. This was a strong church, don't get me wrong. But there was this junk swirling around 
which happens to every church, right? And so Paul was writing this letter with authority, oh, so excited that this was a church that was the result of him bringing the gospel to Ephesus and then people going out and starting churches. Paul was in prison rejoicing with joy that he was there because he was there because he was called to bring the gospel to the Gentiles and churches were popping up everywhere. He could rejoice. He said, this is awesome. He told the Philippians, don't worry that I'm in, in jail. This is actually turning out to the furthering of the gospel. Not to mention, I get to preach to all the guards that I'm chained to. What, what an attitude. I, I need that kind of attitude. You need that kind of attitude. Because sometimes when we're in a position of suffering, we're just complaining, get me out. And not seeing the bigger picture of what God has in store for you. He's given you an opportunity in your trial to do something for him. And Paul rejoiced. He says, I have great conflict and agony that I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many that have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. Wow. Paul really knows how to say things. <laughs> Paul had such an incredible prayer life. I'll tell you what, you want to grow, spend more time praying. Spend more time praying. Up your prayer life. Now, I know the enemy will try to distract you. Your phone will ring. The kids will go off. The dog will swallow the cat. You know, something will happen. When you're determined to get off alone and pray, something will happen. You just, you know what? You just keep going. Prayer is powerful. Prayer changes things. I remember once reading about Spurgeon. Had a huge church. God had blessed him and used him mightily in London. And it was before the service and some guests had arrived and they kind of wanted to see the facility and, and so he was showing them around. And then, he, and then he said to him, he says, hey, you guys want to see the boiler room? And they're like, look at each other like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, the boiler room. And so he took him down in the boiler room underneath the sanctuary. And when they got down there, they discovered 700 people praying before the service. Because their question was, why, why, is, why are the services so powerful? And he goes, let's go see the boiler room. Seven, I wish we had 700 people praying before the service. For a move of the Spirit, for hearts to receive, for the power of the Word of God to go out and penetrate the hearts and lives of men and women. Prayer is powerful. Geiswin said this, he said, if you want to see how popular a church is, come on Sunday. He said, if you want to see how popular a pastor is, come Sunday night. And then he said, if you want to see how popular popular God is, attend a prayer meeting. He said, I want you guys to be knitted together in love. He, he wanted to encourage them, to encourage them being knit together in love so they could attain all the riches and the full assurance of understanding of the knowledge and the mystery of God. See, the importance of the church having unity, being knit together, woven tightly, can't separate can't break us up. We're interlocking our arms. See, because the enemy can destroy a church that's splintered with people with contentions towards one another, division, uh, different beliefs and doctrine. We need to be on the same page. If we have problems, we need to settle our differences. That's what defines us as Christians. When we have a problem with somebody, we, we settle it. We go and get it healed. By the power of the Holy Spirit. To be knit together in love is so important for a strong fellowship. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, it says this about Jonathan and David, King David. Jonathan was the uh, son of Saul, remember? It says, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. These were brothers in the Lord. 
who had such a deep love, they would give their life for each other to protect one another and their families. That's the idea of what Paul, I, I no doubt, is reflecting on this. Are you knitted together with the family of God? Are you knitted together in love? Is the enemy going to be able to separate you? Or are you so strong, the enemy is going to have to flee? See, wolves and false teachers can come in and destroy the church that's not knit together in love and unity. They come in with their false doctrines. They come in with their philosophies. They come in with their traditions of men, and they try to infiltrate. There's a lot of groups that you, you'll find that they, uh, they are trained, though they call themselves Christians, are not Christians, but they are trained to argue with Christians and to lead you astray. But if you're knit together in love and you, 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 you spend time in the word and you get off and you pray, you're going to be strong in the Lord. The church that's full of love will stand strong. And so he encourages them to be knit together according to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ Jesus is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's all in this book. You don't add to this book. You don't take away from this book. You read this book. Well, I want to know God's will. Read the book. Well, what would God do? Read the book. Well, I'm, I'm going through this. There's nothing new under the sun. Read the book. All the answers are here. Wisdom and knowledge are at our fingertips. Hello, do you believe it? There's a book in here called Proverbs. It's, it's a book on wisdom. There's 31 chapters, one for each day. It's, it's July 10th. What chapter do you think I read today? Wisdom and knowledge. And, and where it says here that it's, it's this hidden treasure, right? I mean, you look at this, and, and he, he tells us that in whom Jesus Christ, in whom is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's, it's, it's not the idea it's hidden from us, but that it's hidden for us. That we have all spiritual things at our fingertips. Are you taking advantage of that? It's, it's not hidden treasures from us. It's hidden treasures for us. What does that mean? We have access. It's kind of like putting your money in the bank. Where's your money? It's hidden in the bank. It's not hidden from me. It's hidden so nobody else can take it away. This little treasure chest is where I go in to dig into the gold, the silver, the precious gems, the rubies that God has in store for me and you. This is where I get my answers. This, oh, you can take everything. Don't take my Bible. But even if they took my Bible, guess what? They can't take the Holy Spirit. And you know what? If I have the Holy Spirit in me, I got all I need. Jesus Christ in me, the hope of glory. I'm sealed. And guess what? He promises that he's going to finish the good work. He's going to finish the good work in you. Now, your wife might not believe that. Your husband might not believe that. Your kids might not believe that because they've seen you all your life. But Jesus Christ, in his word, told us that he's going to finish the good work in all of us. His, the job of the Holy Spirit is to get us to the finish line. It's not based on you. It's based on his promise. Now, you can either fight it the whole way or submit yourself and be used in a mighty, powerful way. Because I know I'm just like you. God says, hey, I want you to do this. And then I try to inform God that maybe it's not the best decision. And he has to make it a little more clear for me. I'm just like you. I'm not any different. But see, the way of the world will put men above God. They'll put men above the laity, the people. And next thing you know, people are looking at a man instead of looking at God. And they're led astray. They're not studying the Bible. They're studying the Book of Mormon. They're studying the New World's Translation. They're studying Watchtower. They're, they're studying something that's written that's not of God. And now they're putting their trust in the traditions of men, and they're putting their trust in men. And 
And they try to come into the church and they try to destroy the church. That's what, that's what Satan wants to do. If he can't stop a church, he's going to join it. Now, don't look at your spouse like. But what I'm saying that there's a, there's a battle going on. When the word is being taught, there's angels present because there's a w- spiritual war that's going on right now that wants to keep you from hearing the truths of God. And though people get upset with me when I mention religion and I mention things and I say certain stuff, I have to say it because I've got to alarm you. I've got to bring, I'm the watchman on the wall. I've got to bring you truth. I've got to know that you, you need to know that there are groups out there that say they're Christians that aren't, that say they love Jesus, but it's not our Jesus. You, you need to know. They trust in false doctrine. Doctrines of demons. They think they're working their way to heaven. It ain't going to happen. Jesus did it all. You're saved by grace and grace alone. In verse verse 4, he says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So this is the church he's commending them. You guys are strong. You guys, he's using military terms, good order and steadfastness. Fastness. There was order in the church. They were strong in the Lord. This church was doing good, but they had all this junk swirling around them, and the, the danger of allowing the junk to swirl around you is that it'll penetrate into the body of Christ, right? You know, it's kind of like when we, we, we tell people that, you know, if you're going to hang out in a junky environment, it's not going to be long before it affects you, Right? So what Paul is going to encourage them is, listen, you need to get the leaven out. You need to not to entertain. And he's saying it to us today. Stop entertaining the philosophies of the world. Stop entertaining the traditions of men. Do they match up to God's word? Stop playing around with empty deceit, which is always spoken of satanic in the New Testament. Stop playing around with the principles of the world and stick to the principles of God's word. You won't go wrong. I want to get strengthened. Read the word. I read and pray more than I ever did before in my life. And you know what I'm not doing enough of? Reading and praying. Don't you feel it? Why? Because there's a hunger in us. God put that hunger in you. I'm not satisfied. I tell you what, if we could live the rest of our life not satisfied, that's a good thing. That's what motivates us to read more, to pray more, to serve more. To realize I haven't arrived until I'm standing in his presence with a new body. Looking him eye to eye and then falling on my face. (laughs) Amen. He warns us against things that will lead us astray. You know, it's funny how when false doctrine goes out, it's like it flies out with wings, doesn't it? I mean, it just hits the internet. Everybody's got it. But the truth goes out at a snail's pace. Hey, did you hear about the latest and greatest? It's all over Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. Woo! Everybody's doing it. Does that make it right? Well, what do you want? Oh, yeah, you're a pastor. You're going to tell me read my Bible. Well, what did you think I was going to say? It's amazing how people are sucked in by philosophy, empty deceit, the principles of the world, traditions of men, and every wind of doctrine that's blowing around that's not of God. And even Christians, Christians who have been in the Word, somebody comes to them, and you know what they say? They say, I'm a Christian too. You know what? I know something you guys don't know. God has shown me something that he's never shown the church. Run. Run. Because usually it's followed by, and if you buy my MP3s or you buy my book, you will know what I know that nobody else knows in the church. Do you know what the Bible tells me? Don't add to this. Don't take away. Don't tell me God's given you some new revelation that nobody ever heard of. Because he said, I got all I need right here in this book. Exactly. So watch out for these guys that say they know something that nobody else knows. That's how the cults get started. 
We've got this information that the church doesn't know about. We must stay strong in the word. The Colossians were strong, but they were in danger of all the junk that was swirling around them. So Paul warns them. He makes it clear to them, be careful. Don't be deceived by persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of the faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Are you thankful for what Jesus has done for you? He delivered me from the pit of hell. And some of you got those same tests. You all have those testimonies. But some of you, he delivered you from a lot worse things than others. Are you thankful? You got to show it. You know, I mean, he's not forcing you to show it. It doesn't depend on your salvation. But gosh, don't you want to show somebody that's done so much for you the appreciation that you have for them? That's why we serve. That's why we get the gospel out. That's why we we turn from our sin. That's why we love. That's why we forgive. That's that's why we err on the the side of grace and love. So important for us to do. He talks to us about having received Jesus. Now walk in him. Are you walking in Christ today? Or are you doing your own thing? He says, not only walk in Christ Jesus our Lord, but be rooted. Are you rooted and grounded in the word of God? Are you like a tree firmly planted in Christ Jesus? If you've got strong roots, nobody's going to uproot you. You can be rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus and built up in him. Those are construction words. A good foundation and then built. We are being built up. Did you know we're lively stones? We make up the house of God, that there's a foundation, there's a chief cornerstone, and then the the believers are these lively stones that, you know, this building is not the house of God, you are. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are having Christ dwelling in you. We are lively stones. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 5 says this, Coming to him, speaking of Jesus Christ, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's good news. Ephesians 2 tells us, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's good stuff. We are living stones that make up the house of God. And oh, what a blessing. So he says, therefore, Having received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Pretty straightforward. Hey, this is what you need to be doing. Would Christ do that? Well, you, you should come over here. Would, would the Lord go over there? Well, you got to try this out. Would, would the Lord want me to try that out? See, the way of the world is not the way we think. That's what makes us set apart and different from the world. You got saved. You stopped cursing, right? Well, most of you did. Every once in a while, it catches us off guard, doesn't it? But don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Snap. We're different, though. People have seen a change in your life. They've seen you do a U-turn, a 180. You're no longer talking or acting or walking like you used to walk. You're now walking for Jesus, talking like Jesus, and acting like Jesus. And they see Jesus in you. 
And so he warns us here, be careful of philosophy. That's a strong warrant. He, run! It's crazy how philosophy has creeped into our colleges. It's crazy how philosophy has creeped, in, creeped into our Christian colleges. When God says, run from it. Did you know most philosophers and psychologists struggle with insecurities and depression and anxiety? And this is who you're going to for your answers? Now, you know, I've known Christians that have gone to secular counselors. And you know what? Some of them, sweet people, they're going to give you good advice. And I've heard, I've heard good things before. But here, here's the problem. Apart from Jesus Christ, they're going to lead you astray down the road. Because they don't see things the same way you do. They may be kind and sweet and have some good input, but eventually you're going to go astray. And you know what? If you're flying a plane from L.A. to Honolulu, you only have to be off one degree to miss it completely. Be careful of philosophy. Stay away from it. You got these people pushing health and wealth doctrine. That's not of God. That if you put your faith in Jesus and you have enough faith, you're going to be rich and healthy. That You won't find that anywhere in the scriptures. That appeals to our flesh. Oh, if I choose God, then I'll be rich. I won't have to get that hip replacement. It's a doctrine from hell. Because as soon as you go bankrupt or you get diagnosed with a terminal disease, it shatters your whole faith. Jesus never promised us that we would be rich and healthy. He promised us everlasting life. The legalists of the time say it's not about faith, it's faith and works. That's, that's from the pit of hell. You're saying if you have to work for your salvation, then Jesus couldn't finish the work on the cross. That's insane. And the Gnostics that were creeping into that area basically were saying that, you know, uh, flesh, material things is evil, the spirit's good. So they, they had this saying that Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah because he was flesh. Or the others would say, well, if he was the Messiah, then when he walked on the beach or in the sand, he didn't leave footprints because he was spirit. He wasn't really material, you know, matter. And so since the Gnostics believed that material matter was sinful and evil, and the Spirit was good, they used it as a license to sin. You just go out and do whatever you want. It's all good. God will get you to heaven. Don't you hear that preached today? People that don't want to preach on sin? People that avoid that? People that don't want to talk about hell? They, they're just making their whole fellowship feel comfortable while they're on their way to hell because they don't know the truth that you need to repent from your sins and ask Jesus in your life and have your life transformed. I know some of this is hard and it's offensive, but it needs to be taught. We need to stay away from the traditions of men. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Sadducees for, the, for keeping the traditions of men and not what God's word says. So he did that to the religious experts. Wow. Hello, does that tell you anything? Oh, my gosh. I need to watch out, and you need to watch out, too. This is why I always tell you guys, don't take my word for anything. But search the Scriptures daily, Acts 17, 11. Search the Scriptures daily to see if what I'm saying is true. You need to dig into your treasure chest and find out whether I'm truthful or a liar. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders for their traditions. Gnostics got their beliefs from the traditions of the world, not from the Word of God. And we've all seen, you know, we, we do things because of tradition, don't we? Why you do that? My dad did that. And I'm not saying it's necessarily bad or good, you know what I'm saying? But you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Your children, you know, I used to always say, I will never act like my dad. I will never talk to my kids like my dad talked to me. And then all of a sudden I find myself talking to my kids just like my dad talked to me. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I look in the mirror and there's dad. <laughs> True story. There was, a, there was a woman married. She would cook meat during the week. She would, she would cook a roast or a prime rib. And her husband noticed that every time she cooked a chunk of meat, she would cut off the ends and throw it away. And he was like, what are you doing? Look, have you seen the meat prices? This, you're throwing away good food. Why are you doing that? She goes, well, that's the way my, my mother did it. So when he got an opportunity when they were all together at the mother-in-law's house, 
he asked her mom, you know, I, I asked your daughter why she cuts off the ends of the meat and throws it away. And uh, she said, because you taught her that. You, that's the way you did it. And, and so I'm going to ask you, why do you do that? And she said, because my mom did that. So luckily, mom was still alive. And so when the opportunity came for this man to speak to his mother-in-law's mom, he said, Grandma, why do you cut the ends off the meat and throw it away? Because my wife does that. Your daughter does that. They said they learned it from you. Why do you cut off the ends of the meat? And she said, well, back in those days, I only had one pan, and it was small, so I cut off the ends. But see, that's how quickly we can get led astray. Why are you doing that? I don't know. What kind of an explanation is that? Now, we all keep traditions, and we do things like our parents did it, and we shouldn't think it's wrong because there's tradition, nor should we think it's right because it's a tradition. But examine it against, the, against God's word, right? Right? Because there's a lot of tradition out there. Does it serve the cause of Christ? Does it reflect the truths of God? I was, I was raised in the Catholic Church. And every uh, Friday, guess what you couldn't eat? Oh, we got some Catholics in here. Meat, right? It was Fish Friday. And back in those days, it was nasty fish. It was fish sticks. It was not like here. I mean, if it was here, I'd be like, Fish Friday. <laughs> Why do we do this? It's not in the Bible. Traditions of men. Why are they lighting candles for the dead? They're dead. You can't light a candle to get somebody into heaven. They're dead. They either trusted in Jesus or they didn't. There's no purgatory. Traditions of men. We've got to really watch out for those traditions of men. And ask yourself, does it, does it, does it point to Jesus? Is it something good? Now, we have a tradition here. And it's a good one. You don't need it to be saved, but we do a thing called agape feast. First Sunday of every month, we go down to a needy, we have a barbecue, and we have fun. Do, do we need to do that? No. Can we? Yes. Does it point to Jesus? I think all it totally points to Jesus. Because what, what does God tell us in the Bible? Have fellowship. Get together. Break bread. Come on, it's Calorie Chapel. We know how to eat here. Right? We go down there, we break bread, we fellowship, we hang out, we play with each other, we have games, we have volleyball, we have corn, we got all kinds of stuff going on. We're encouraging people, we're, we're laying hands on them, we're, we're baptizing people. And then he says, watch out for worldly principles. Principles of the world that are not of God. Watch out, there's a lot out there. Are there any good stuff? Yeah, stuff that we probably even teach our children. What's the principle of the world? Do unto others as you would want done unto you. Haven't you ever told your kids that? Be kind. If you be kind, people will be kind to you. Do good and, and good things will happen to you. If you do bad, bad things will happen to you. Do unto others as you'd want done to you. Study hard, you'll go far. Work hard, you'll, you'll be successful. Do unto others as you want them to do to you. Now, we've, we've probably even taught our kids that stuff. And it's, it's kind of a good thing, isn't it? Until you try to bring that same principle into your relationship with God. Because here's what's going to happen. I was good today, you owe me. Ooh. Ooh. He didn't owe you nothing. He's already given you everything. If you had nothing in this life and were just sick the whole time and poor and living in the street, but you had salvation, it would be worth it. It would be for me. God doesn't owe us anything. You know why God gives you things? Because he wants to bless you because you're his kid. He give, doesn't God bless you even when you're defiant? All right, three people. 
Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You know you're doing something, you shouldn't be doing it. You haven't got that thing right. You're thinking, you know, hey, God, God must be okay with it. Don't misunderstand his grace for being okay with what you're doing. See, because we have this attitude, if we bring that principle of the world into our relationship with God, we think if we do something, God, God must owe us because I just did something for you. Now pay me more. Or if I mess up, God's going to squash me. Do you guys think that Jesus, the Lord, our God, is just up in heaven waiting for you to mess up so he can go, look at him, he blew it. Oh, I've been waiting for this. Yeah, come up from that, Steve. If that's how you think, you don't know the heart of the Father. You don't understand his love for you. And some Christians have been living in sin for two, three years, doing whatever, and they think God maybe is okay with it because he hasn't done anything to them. You're running out of time. He loves you. He's everything. He's patient, long-suffering. That's why we're still here. He still wants more people to get saved. He loves you so much. So he says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's just a slap in the face to the Gnostics right there. He doesn't even have to mention Gnostics. He doesn't mention Judaizers. He doesn't mention Eastern mysticism. He just tells truth, and the truth will set him free. Right there, that verse, verse 9, is a slap in the face to the Gnostics who didn't believe Jesus was Messiah because he was in an earthly body. And what does Paul say? For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. (laughs) It was like, and then the Gnostics went, ah, started pulling their hair out. I can't believe he's saying that. La, 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 la. Sorry, I'll pull it together. (laughs) And check this out, verse 10, our last verse. And you are complete in him. Who is the head over all principality and power. See, he puts to rest another belief here. Because they were starting to get into angel worship. And he says, why why go to an angel when you just go to the The main guy. How can I go to the main guy? Because I'm complete in him. How can I do that? He tore the veil. He made a way when there wasn't one. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you uh, for your precious word, Lord God. I pray that it takes heart in us today and that we go out different, changed, new, fresh, trusting in you, to be guided by you and you alone. If there's anyone here that doesn't know the Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would uh, touch their hearts right now. If you want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, just pray this in your heart. Pray, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I believe you died for me. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe you're God. I believe you're the only way. So I ask for forgiveness of my sins, and I ask you to save me right now in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that, you're a child of God. And for the rest of us, Father, we pray for strength. Crazy times we live in. We're getting close, Lord God. Help us to finish and to finish well. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. amen. God bless you guys.